Well, today we are continuing our study through the walkthrough of that very first and longest sermon that we have of Jesus called the Sermon on the Mount. We're calling it Summer on the Mount. It's recorded for us in its entirety in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, but uh, Mark, Luke, and John also give us little pieces all throughout their writing of this sermon. If you were not here with us last week, you'll know that we started in verse 17 and we went to verse 17, like the first six words is all we got to. So this is kind of a, a continuation of verses 17 through 20. If you weren't here, I encourage you to go online and listen to that message. It kind of sets the stage or begins the conversation for these four verses, which really are critical in understanding where Jesus is going to go, not only in this sermon, but the context in which Jesus will live his life over the next three years. If you remember, Jesus is in and around the areas of Judea and Galilee. He's teaching a message. His message is one of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of God is close. And you can be a part of it. Now that would not have been a foreign message to the people of Jesus' day. All from the days of the Old Testament all the way through the days of Jesus, they were looking forward to something. They were praying for what they called the year of our Lord. It was the year in which the, the Lord would come, the Messiah would come, he would set up a throne. And you know, when they were thinking of that, they thought in earthly terms. They thought in terms of someone who would sit on an earthly throne, would reign from an earthly kingdom. So that isn't the idea that Jesus had in mind, as which uh, you'll see see as we go through this sermon causes a little bit of conflict and if you read through the gospels they're kind of always in conflict with the the idea of a kingdom that they had being an earthly one and the idea of the kingdom that God had being a spiritual kingdom but just because Jesus is out in the wilderness preaching this message of a kingdom to a people who have been looking for a kingdom well he is garnering quite the crowd the crowd is also uh, magnified a bit because Jesus has been doing lots of miracles he's been healing people so anybody who had anybody sick is coming and bringing and because of that there's a, a pretty good crowd around Jesus on this day when he heads up on the mountainside followed first by those who were closest to him those earliest followers and he begins to teach if you remember from the last few weeks the first 16 verses of Matthew chapter 5 are what most scholars call the introduction to Jesus's message verses 1 through 12 contain the Beatitudes which are descriptions of what people who are in this kingdom of God look like if you want to know what kingdom people are like well Jesus says here it is and then in verses 13 14 15 and 16 Jesus really gives us a short job description of kingdom people he says as a kingdom person your job is this you are to be the salt of the earth don't lose your saltiness. If you do, how will anybody taste that the Lord is good? You are to be the light of the world. That's who you've been called to be as kingdom people. Keep shining the light. Don't put it under a bushel. It will be through you that people see the presence of God here on this earth. Well, then we come to verse 17, which is where we started and ended last week. Most scholars say that verse 17 and following, uh, that they are the beginning of the body of Jesus's message. In fact, they will set the stage for everything Jesus will say in the rest of his sermon. So let's read through it one more time and then we'll go back and we'll try to catch up for where we were. Matthew chapter five, beginning in verse 17, Jesus tells the crowd, do not think, do not assume, do not believe what you have been told that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but I have come to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter or the least stroke of a pen will in any way disappear from the law until everything has been accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do so, well, he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands, well, they will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you the truth, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And when Jesus said these words, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, don't you know that that made the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, all of a sudden their ears have perked up because they fashioned themselves as models of righteousness, as pictures. If you wanted a, a GQ uh, magazine, but you just called it righteousness magazine and what righteousness looks like well they thought their picture would have been right there on the cover they would have been the star of that that's what they considered themselves and maybe before we move on it would help at the end to kind of write to kind of say at the beginning well what is righteousness as Jesus is speaking of righteousness uh, Webster de defines righteousness like this it is 
the quality of being morally true. The quality of being morally true. And you may ask, being morally true to what? Well, if you were to ask the scribes and the Pharisees, and I think even ask Jesus, they, you know, he would say, well, be morally true to the law. It's just that Jesus' definition of the law and their definition of the law were somewhat different. And what we're going to see throughout this sermon of Jesus and Jesus' life is there were two types of righteousness that Jesus will address. One was called false righteousness, or I'm calling it, in fact, I may call it something different. Uh, if you have been around the American landscape uh, in the last two to three years, which would be most all of you, unless you're less than three years old, and then you're probably in the back. How many of you have heard of fake news? Fake news. I mean, I hear all that. Fake news. That's fake news. Fake news. Well, I'm going to call the very first thing here fake righteousness. It's kind of like fake news. It's, it's fake or false righteousness. And it was all about the outward appearance. Like when you would put clean clothes on a dirty body. Anybody ever done that? Any of you ever been outside working, doing a little bit of stuff that come in? And it, for me, it would be my wife who says, well, I really want to run here. And you don't have time to shower. She says, I'm ready to go. And you just put something on and you are hoping that she has put enough Febreze in whatever she washed your stuff in, that the stuff underneath, that the smell doesn't come shining through. Well, that's kind of a, that's kind of a, a it's, it's a false sense of what's underneath those clean clothes, isn't it? My granny would have said it like this, putting makeup on a pig. You know, the pig may look good for the moment, but underneath the pig is still a pig. Well, that was fake righteousness. And if you were to ask Jesus, well, how, how is fake righteousness played out? Well, as we see, as we go through this sermon, he's going to say it's played out like this. It's played out by a person who would take a little bit of pride in that they didn't physically murder someone, but they didn't mind one bit doing things and saying things that destroyed a person's reputation or talking about someone behind their back. It's a person who wouldn't have a problem praying at all. It's just that when they pray, they, they say long phrases and that they say things so that other people will see them and say, my, how spiritual those people are. On the inside though, not a lot going on. Fake, false righteousness. The other type of righteousness which Jesus will, will address is what I call real righteousness. It's an inward type of righteousness. I'm actually going to call it a Jesus righteousness. It's when the way you live your life, what you do, the actions that come out of you don't come out of any impure motives. They come out of a person who has set their heart, their inside on being like God. It's those actions of people who have said, God, I want you to come in. Jesus, I want you to do a work in me. So, so much so that when I go out into this world, well, I'm just naturally salt. I'm naturally light. People get a taste and a flavor of what God is, not because I'm trying to do that, but because I naturally do that. He cared about the heart. You prayed and you fasted because you were seeking the heart of God. The problem with both kinds of righteousness is this. On the front end, they often look the same, don't they? It's hard to tell on the front end. They both pray. They both fast. They probably both try to avoid committing murder or they're not out there, you know, advocating. You should just leave your wife, leave your husband. Adultery is rampant. All this. They're, they're not out there. On the front end, they look the same. Over time, though, you begin to see that one well, one is what we will call a self-righteousness. It's self-based. It's all about what I can do. It's about being better than the person next to me. It's about, it's about seeking a way to, to be right with God based on what I can physically do in my body. The other is what I call a Jesus righteousness, an inward righteousness. You're seeking the heart of God. It's Jesus-based. My hope, everything I have is is predicated it is based upon what Jesus did for me on the cross and when he says unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees it had to be a blow to them because they thought their actions were it and what Jesus was saying to them was this you can have all the right stuff in the world but if you neglect the son of God if you forsake the Messiah who has come and, and is standing right in front of your teaching well anyone who would do that you can't even enter the kingdom of heaven. So back to these four verses with that is kind of, a, kind of a, uh, uh, an oversimplified maybe background into righteousness versus self-righteousness. This is where we ended last week, verse 17. Do not think 
that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. And again, I think Jesus begins this way because although Jesus hasn't been teaching long, he's been teaching long enough that there are already rumors out there floating out about him. He's teaching his disciples, you don't have to obey the law of Moses. He's teaching his disciples, you don't have to conform to, to what we have, to what our standards and our traditions are. So they're already beginning to think that Jesus is doing something. They think he's doing away with what he calls the law and the prophets or what we would actually call our Old Testament, particularly the Torah the first five books of the Old Testament. And then even more particular than that, the law of Moses, especially the Ten Commandments. And because of that, they've got some serious questions about who Jesus is. In fact, the biggest question floating around the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, and even the common people today is this. Who do you think you are, Jesus? Who do you think you are that you can interpret the law of Moses for us, that you can do all of these things and you can tell us what it means? So Jesus begins the body of his message addressing a false claim that is evidently already in circulation about him, that he is seeking to do away with the law and the prophets. And that's where we left off with this verse. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. And most of you know there's a little phrase that comes after that. And if you've been a student of scripture long or, or even if you read with us just a little bit ago when we read, you know there's a little phrase that comes next, which I'm actually gonna skip over right now. The reason I'm gonna skip over it is this, is because verse 18 is really a continuation of this thought. That little phrase that is stuck in there is really the summation and I'm going to make it the summation of what we talk about today. So I'm going to go from here directly into verse 18. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. In fact, if you want to know what I am teaching about the law and the prophets, here it is. In fact, I tell you then to heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter or the least stroke of a pen will in any way disappear from the law until everything has been accomplished. Now, let me ask, anybody grow up a King James Version like I did, if you grew up going to church? Does anybody remember? You'll have to say it pretty loud because uh, for me to hear. Does anybody remember what the King James, how they translated that word smallest letter or least stroke of a pen? Jot and tittle. That was right. Jot and tittle. And I'm glad we have this version because if you just came up to me and said, what is a jot and what is a tittle? I said, I have no idea. It sounds like a candy that you would buy at Walgreens or something or Walmart. So jot, do you have your jot and tittles today? Well, a jot was actually the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And uh, a tittle was uh, what I would call a punctuation mark. Uh, I, if you're a Greek or a Hebrew person, you got a longer definition than that. But I like, it's just one of those little markings that, that might have to do with the tense of a verb or the tense of something that's going on, or it might even tell you in a word where to put, put emphasis on that word, just a tiny little marking. So when Jesus says this, he says, if you think I'm doing away with the law of Moses, if you think I have somehow excusing people from doing what Moses asked you to do, guess again, I tell you that won't happen until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet that those words were written in, or even the tiniest punctuation mark, not a single one of them will disappear until they've all been accomplished. Jesus is saying, he said, I'm not doing away with the law of Moses. Everything in the law of Moses is going to come to pass. Therefore, I'll tell you, verse 19, anyone, and anyone would have included Jesus, wouldn't have. Anyone, including myself, who would set aside one of the least of these commands? And they thought Jesus had already done that. If you read the book of Mark, you have the story of Jesus' disciples plucking the grain on, on the Sabbath day and they accuse him of breaking. That comes before all of this in the book of Mark, whether it was really like that or not, I don't know. But anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do so, well, he would be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And in their eyes, Jesus is actually kind of condemning himself because they think Jesus has already done that. Well, he says, you're going to be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands, he will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. What I want you to see in this, because I think it's critical to understanding the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, is this. Jesus is going to great lengths to say, I'm not doing away with the law of Moses. In fact, my kingdom and what Moses taught, we are not in competition with each other. We're on the same team. So my question becomes, so Jesus... If you're not doing away with the law of Moses, where we left last week was this, then what are you doing with the law of Moses? When as you read the books of the Bible, and especially Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Jesus tells his disciples, you know, you can put grain on the Sabbath, you can do this, all the things that they saw was law. What are you doing with it if you're not doing away with it? Back to the little phrase we skipped in verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, 
I have come to fulfill them. Well, what on earth does that mean? And maybe to understand what Jesus is saying, you have to know something about the law, something that the law of Moses actually had in common with our law today. So I need a little bit of audience participation. Breathe deep with me. Don't exhale unless you're really healthy. Uh, uh, that was a joke. Probably not a good one. <laughs> anyway, I just thought of it on the spur of the moment. Uh, so I got a question to ask you. How many of you have ever gotten a speeding ticket? Oh, quite a few. How many of you have ever gotten a speeding ticket and you've had to go to court? Oh, quite a few over there. I'm, I'm going to ask my man that he doesn't really know what's happening over there. Wade Riggins, I saw you raise your hand on both of those. Come up here with me for a minute. It's going to be your night to shine. <laughs> I, I, I know, you're, you're gonna do wonderful. So you've had a ticket, uh, where'd you, where, you have a secret, do too, don't you? Uh, my wife and family don't even know this yet. <laughs> <laughs> it was busy Friday afternoon. I was coming home from the wonderful Jackson County area. Yeah. And I got stopped. And I, I have not had time to confess this to my wife. <laughs> or, or my son, which I just got onto about oh. two weeks ago for speeding. We have, ca we, we have counseling too. <laughs> you're supposed to build me up, not make me look some. <laughs> it is okay. That's what you're supposed to do as a man, hide it. Repeat. Like when we go shopping, we put it, we put our stuff in the closet. Yes. And then yes, later yes. on, we pull it out. Yes. And when they ask, how long have you had that? You say, oh, I've had that a long time. Oh, that's been hanging I in my closet. That. I just, it's been there forever. <laughs> I know. That's how it's supposed to work. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, you, on your fastest ticket, how, yes. how fast were you, were you going? This time? Well, any time. Watch, watch your, well, is, is this is time this, the fastest? Is this confession? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> This was a 70 and a 55, but I've got a good excuse. Oh, yeah. The car in front of me was being towed, and oh. a brake light fell off. I avoided it, but the, by the time I passed, the os ossifer didn't, didn't. <laughs> he, did, he didn't care. He said, what's the, what's the fastest you're supposed to go, even if passing? I said, sir, I don't know. The, the posted speed limit, Honest 55. Answer. Oh, was that the answer? That, that was, the, I didn't know the answer, but that was the answer from the authorities. Yes. Well, I didn't know. I would have kind of thought you just, you go have her, you got to get around them. I got to get the job done. That's what I, that's what I thought. Well, I, I would have been right there with you. Well, <laughs> well, I have a question. So when you had to go to court, did it ever, did it ever enter your mind? Because where, where Paul is going to go with this thing about the law that I think we have in common a little bit with the law of Moses, this, he says the law had an inherent curse built into it. The curse of the law was this. Did you ever... And in that moment of getting a ticket, having to go before the judge, did you ever think of using as a defense when he says, well, Mr. Reans, why, why were you going so fast? Did you ever think to say, we, let's not even talk about that. Do you know how many of the laws I've kept? <laughs> Do you realize I've never murdered anyone? I thought that. Oh, yeah. I even thought that coming home Friday. Yeah. You have, we have a lot in common with, with the guy in the text here. The yes. guy in the text here. Because what the point Jesus is making is this. The inherent curse of the law is this. You can't claim innocence on one point if you've broken any other point. You're still what? Guilty. Guilty. Oh, I Guilty. hope you don't have to go to court over that because they have it on tape. You've already yes. admitted it. Like if you were, and they black that out. <laughs> we'll, we'll blot that part out in here and not let that, not let that the happen. The terrible thing is I even use someone's name here that goes to church that is another state trooper. Oh. Skip Stewart. Did it help? I waited and used it after he wrote the ticket. I did not try to persuade. I did use that, but it didn't, I thought he may just tear it up and let me go, but he did not. Oh. I've got to find skips. I think he goes to the 8 o'clock service here. Oh, well. Uh, if he'll place a call. Yeah. We will tell him to do that. Hey, thank you so much. And that was not an endorsement of speeding to any of Wade's family out there who have found out new information this morning. Here was the inherent curse of the law was this. You can never claim innocence from the law even if you had offended in one point. You were guilty. 
Guilty demands punishment from a just and holy, not only God, but from a just society. Look at how the Living Bible uh, puts uh, uh, James chapter 2, verse 10. And the person who keeps every law of God but makes one little slip up is just as guilty as the person who has broken every law there is. You see, they had either forgotten, ignored, or somehow never fully realized to begin with something that Jesus knew. That the curse of the law was this, no one could keep it perfectly. Especially those people who thought they could. So yeah, they would say murder is wrong. Why would you say murder is wrong? Well, murder is in the law of Moses. Don't commit murder. But Jesus would say, you evidently didn't read the entire thing. Because do you realize that when you hurt someone's reputation, when you talk about somebody behind their back, when you go out and you slander someone, that you've already murdered them? And you congratulate yourself and you think you've done what God required because you didn't sleep around on the person you were married to. And yet you go out in the world and you look at people in a way that isn't right and you use people in a way that isn't right. Do you not realize that that was just as wrong? So these people who fashioned themselves as models of righteousness and right living, Jesus says you don't even understand the very law that you're trying to proclaim and the law that you're trying to teach. You see, Jesus' point will be this, if you're not, if, if I'm not taken away from the law, he would say, I'm telling you that if you're trying to be right with God by keeping the law, you're already sunk. No one could do it. Paul would even later go on in the book of Romans and he would say it was the law that showed him just how messed up he was in the first place. You know, I sin and I often think, oh, bummer. <laughs> I sin and I think, oops. I sin and I think, my bad. Anybody said that? Do something wrong. My bad. Like, excuse me, because I'm just bad up here. You know, I got this bad thing going on. But Paul in the book of Romans, who personifies the law as a person, and, and he says, if the law were a person, if the person was speaking to you, the law would say this, your sin is not an oops. Your sin is not a bummer. Your sin is not a my bad. The law said that your sin is a death sentence. It's what the law says. And there's no way out of it because as Paul said in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the glory of God is the presence of God. We've sinned, we've fallen short. And because of that, the penalty is we miss the glory of God because you sinned, because you broke God's law. He says, you deserve punishment. And the punishment, well, the punishment is spiritual death and missing the presence of God. And the reason Jesus is saying all of this on the front end is that for the gospel to be good news, you got to understand how bad the bad news is. And I'm not sure that they understood how bad the bad news is that even if you've offended in one point, you're guilty of all. And the sentence of that was a death sentence. That was the penalty of the law. Paul puts it this way in Romans 6, 23, for the wages that the payment you get for when you mess up, the payment for my bad, the payment for my oops, the payment for my bummer moments, well, is death. But then here's the good news. I have not come to abolish them. I have come to fulfill them. And fulfill was a word that meant to make full, to complete, to satisfy. In fact, some of your versions will say satisfy. What I'm doing is this. He said, I'm fulfilling, I'm completing what the law demanded. And as we've said, I'm, I'm going to call the band back up because we're going to sing a song at the end. And I'm going to, we could have really made this three weeks. We won't do it today. We had such a good time with Wade up there. I wouldn't have missed that for the world. <laughs> there were really two types of law that were out there. Uh, and again, I'm oversimplifying. There was ceremonial law and there was moral law. And when Jesus says, I've come to fulfill those things, when you think of ceremonial laws, think of Passover, think of uh, uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, think of those, those celebratory events that they would have that often involved the weekly and the yearly sacrifices that would be a part of their system. Passover was, a, was a, an annual event that they did that celebrated or commemorated their coming out of Egypt when they uh, were in slavery and bondage and they would take the blood of an animal and they would put it on the door frames and the door post and and on that night, they celebrated that because they had the blood there that God passed over. And all of a sudden, when Jesus says, I didn't come to take that away. I didn't come to make light of that. What I'm telling you is this, is that was a temporary moment. 
that was but a shadow of a greater reality that was one day coming. For it would not be the blood of an animal or a goat or a, or a pigeon or a turtle dove. The Hebrew writer would say this, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. It pointed to what the Hebrew writer called an eternal reality. That the reality of this shadow that they celebrated every single year was that one day there would come a redemptive moment in history so great that it would look back and wipe away every sin on that end. And it would look this way and it would wipe away every sin of the people going forward who had done what? Not sought to reach God on their self-righteousness, but sought to reach God simply on the basis of what Jesus had done for them on the cross. And all the ceremonial laws that they talked about, in fact, there's this moment, sorry, there's this moment in the book of Luke where Jesus has been resurrected. It's that evening. He's walking with some of his disciples towards uh, uh, a a place called Emmaus. And Jesus comes up beside these two disciples. And uh, as he's walking with them, they're talking about all the things that have happened in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, well, what's happened in Jerusalem? And these two guys are like, what in the world? I mean, have you been under a rock somewhere? Everybody knows what's happened in Jerusalem. Jesus says, well, tell me, tell me. it what happened and then these two guys begin to tell Jesus all about Jesus and what's happened in Jerusalem Uh, the uh, the, what I like is the verse that Jesus says uh, as he goes on and as he talks with them verse 25 of Luke 24 Jesus says to them oh how slow you guys are to believe everything the prophets have spoken I mean, did not Isaiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and the other prophets, didn't they tell you that the Messiah had to suffer these things and enter his glory? Then listen to what he tells these two guys in verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to these two men on a road what all the scriptures and all the prophets had been pointing to, what they meant. And they prophesied, he said, they concerned himself. Again, in the book of Luke, Jesus would say to the people, this is what I told you while I'm still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Jesus says, I'm not taking it away. I'm just telling you it was pointing to me. It was pointing to me. So unless you accept me, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you come before God with the righteousness that that exceeds these people who just want a righteousness based on their ability to keep this and don't do that because that's what law is easy. I mean, I mean, mean, it's hard. Nobody can do it, but we we, we think it's easy because we can put a box, we can check it. I did this, check off, it's done. (laughs) Jesus said the curse of the law was this. You're guilty even if you missed one single point of it. The other part of the law is not ceremonial law. It's what I would call the moral laws of God. Don't commit adultery, you know, don't don't steal, don't do all of those bad things that are in there, covet, all those things. He says, I didn't come to do away with that either. I'm not saying you, I'm not saying that you can take away the, the least part, the tiniest punctuation mark. But if you ask what I've come to do, well, the law demanded punishment for those things. And I knew you couldn't pay your own price because the wages of your sin is death. (laughs) And you couldn't pay the price for somebody else's sin because, well, you would be dead. The wages of their sin is death too. So Jesus said, what I'll do is this. I will come to earth as God, born under the very law I created to redeem, to buy back those who were cursed by the curse of the law. And what he said was this, I'm not taking it away. I'm satisfying the demand for the punishment, the law said. So when you couldn't pay for your own sin and when I couldn't pay for my sin, Jesus said, I'll come and I'll live perfectly. So Father, I will offer myself in the place of them. And God allowed what one writer called the greatest exchange in all of history my filthy stuff for his perfect sacrifice. (laughs) Do you know what that meant for Jesus? Well, it meant the cross. It meant that he looked at the world and he said, punish me, mock me, kill me. So back to the people of his day. Do not think come to do away with the law with the prophets not come to do away with them 
I've just come to tell you that everything the prophets wrote were pointing to me. And I'm telling you that when you could not pay the price for your own sin, I stepped in the history and I paid that price for you. It was a beautiful moment that I so wish they could have understood. And maybe this last song that we're gonna sing today, maybe as you sing these words, they will mean a little bit more to you than they have at any other time that you have sung it. Uh, Because you can stand before God one day and you can say, hey God, look at what I've done. Or you can stand before God one day and pull out your pockets and say, I got nothing. Except for that day, July 31st of 2022, when I said, Father, would you come into my heart? I wholly put my faith in what you have done on the cross and not my ability to keep it right. That's what this song is talking about. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust even the sweetest thing that I may do, but I will wholly and completely put my trust in what you did for me on the cross.